All right, special correspondent Carl Bostic joins us now from Tel Aviv. Carl, I want to say thank you very much for joining us here on Newsday. We are now three weeks into the war between Israel and Hamas, and has the invasion by Israel now begun? And what will it take for Israel to call this successful? Bring us up to speed with the latest from where you are right now. Well, you already reported a few uh, activities that are happening already today. Just for example, you had. Uh, the Israeli Defense Force spokesperson, you know, talking about this warning for Gaza residents to move south. And the reason why is this, Gaza in the end, keep in mind, it's a narrow strip of land, only 25 miles long. Gaza City is in the north. Uh, those attacks that have been coming into Israel uh, from Gaza, they're largely from the north. That's where Hamas has its uh, command and control centers. That's where their rockets are being launched from. Uh, that's that's really the base of their of the military operations. Uh, so that's why they're warning them because part of their strategy is really, it's really two main priorities. They wanna make sure Hamas no longer has the ability to ever strike into uh, Israel ever again. Uh, they want to destroy its military capability. That means going into Gaza. But instead of a wide-scale invasion, since Friday, we're just seeing targeted incursions. Uh, those troops that first went in with uh, tanks and armored vehicles, uh, uh, also with aerial bombardments since uh, Friday, more troops are being added to it. So yes, troops are on the ground inside Gaza, but just a few miles inside Gaza. In fact, for the first time in nearly 20 years, the Israeli flag was raised over Gaza. So what they're doing right now, they're trying to prepare the ground before they can actually go into Gaza City because that's where the actual combat fighting would begin. In fact, that spokesman said also in that press conference that this would just be amongst the several stages of fighting that they're anticipating. And that's why also last night, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, in his nationwide TV address, he said that we are now into stage two of this war, stage first. Stage one was just only exclusively that aerial bombardment where so many uh, targets were being hit and thousands of people were being killed. Last night, about 450 uh, targets being uh, being hit. But also give an indication of just how much tension and fear there is on the ground. You talk about uh, those raids or looting of the warehouses, uh, the UN agency UNRWA. Yes, a possible sign of breakdown in, in civil uh, disorder. What they were doing, they were looting supplies that had just arrived from the Rafa crossing from Egypt. To put things in perspective, before the war, 500 trucks were arriving into Gaza each day um, with food, supplies, and fuel into Gaza. 500 each day. Since the war began, only 84 trucks total have come into Gaza. So you have dire situation, a shortage of food, supplies, many supplies that were being uh, looted or raided were just basic hygienic supplies, the supplies you need to live by, and also flour. So that's what's going on there. And then, of course, fuel, no fuel at all is available. And that's why it's controversial, because you also have to keep in mind this. This didn't happen overnight. The Israelis maintain that, you know, uh, Hamas has been preparing for this for years. They have their own stockpile of fuel, uh, as many as half a million liters of diesel underground. So any fuel that would arrive into Gaza, uh, Israel fears could be siphoned off by uh, by Hamas because they rely on an underground network of tunnels up to 300 miles long, a spider web of tunnels, let's say, that's become an underground metro city that requires fuel. So that's why you have that kind of attention. It's also increased by the fact that now, just after the war, you had a public opinion poll in the leading newspaper, Mariv, where 65% of Israelis wanted um, Israel to go in a full-scale uh, invasion. Now that 65% is down to 45%, and that's largely because of the uh, unknown fate of the more than 200 hostages. The numbers keep going up by the day. Now it's 230 hostages are being held in Gaza, uh, most likely underground in that network of tunnels. Of those 330, uh, more than half have foreign passports of 25 countries, and of those 230, uh, more, at least 30 of them are children under the age of 18. So that's why you have a lot of uh, uncertainty right there. But to call this a success, it's, it's about making sure Hamas never has the ability to strike at Israel again, but also to recover those hostages. And those two goals may actually kind of you know, work against each other, because once you start the full-scale invasion, there's no guarantee about the fate and safety of the hostages. It's a really stressful situation. Really stressful. Um, is it realistic to think that Hamas can even be defeated at all? Well, you need to really kind of zoom out, if you will, and just look at what's really at play here. It's not just about 
the kind of threat that Hamas poses uh, militarily. Yes, it's a militant organization. Uh, yes, uh, Israel is calling it a terror organization. Uh, many countries in the West see it as a terror organization, but at the UN, of course, a resolution wasn't even allowed uh, to be passed to call it a terror organization. Nonetheless, uh, it seems uh, perhaps very likely that Israel will be able to destroy its military capability so that it never is able to, to do what it did that horrendous day of October 7th. But what's different is this, uh, Hamas is also a political movement. Uh, that's why they appeal uh, to Palestinians who have really felt stifled by, they call them Israeli occupation in the West Bank and Gaza. So you actually have people who admire what Hamas is doing. To put things in perspective, you've got more than 200 hostages right now, and Hamas is now, for the first time, they're issuing a statement, even though it was always kind of a uh, hinted at from the very beginning that they want a full swap. They want an all for all approach to resolving this crisis. In other words, there's 6,000 uh, Palestinian prisoners in Israeli jails and prisons. They are proposing a swap of those more than 200 uh, Israeli hostages and foreigners for those 6,000 prisoners. So that appeals to uh, you know, the, the people on the street in the West Bank and Gaza. And one final mention is this, you know, the last time you had the second intifada and I was there covering it and I was covering the 2014 war in Gaza for Rise TV. You know, uh, of the Palestinians, uh, more than a third of the population are under the age of 30. They have no memory of, of fighting that last war against Israel or the Second Intifada. They have no memory of Yasser Arafat. So you really have a new generation of people, but not only a new generation of people, one that's really filled with futility, uh, high poverty, uh, no education. Uh, you actually have a situation where young people, the young men especially, you ask them what they dream of doing, they're not talking about being doctors, going to school, or being successful, raising families. They're not even talking about getting married. Uh, many of them haven't even had relationships before. All they're talking about, many of them at least, only dream of becoming martyrs. All right, um, Carl. Israel's leader uh, and the PM, talking about Benjamin Netanyahu, had will as well. Uh, he has been trying to manage this crisis. Talk to me, do you think, what's your assessment of what he's done, the rhetoric he's been pushing out, and more importantly, his perception as a leader in Israel at this very, very troubled time. Well, right now, Prime Minister Netanyahu, he's facing a headwind of criticism for just a, a lot of reasons, because how could uh, the region's most powerful military uh, power uh, you know, have such a... a uh, a debacle of a collapse of military and intelligence failure. Uh, and, you know, as they say in the U.S., where I'm from, you know, in the case of the president in the U.S., they say the buck stops here. But we haven't heard that from Benjamin Netanyahu. Instead, in last night's uh, nationwide address, he was saying that uh, he was never given any intelligence warnings by security and military chiefs. Uh, this is while a war is, is about to begin, and he's, he's pinning the blame on them. He's doubling down on on saying he's not responsible, saying those questions will come later. He even posted a, uh, a tweet late into the night after midnight, and again, insisting that it was the heads of Shin Bet and uh, the military who failed to deliver the intelligence. They themselves actually apologized. They themselves actually said, we are responsible for this failure in intelligence and lapse in security. Benjamin Netanyahu has not done that. Because of this backlash against this tweet, he's now retracted it. He's in fact issued another tweet apologizing for making the mistake of posting that tweet. But he's not apologizing for the breakdown on intelligence security, a breakdown that could have come because of the failure of his leadership. And right now he's simply saying, I'm more focused on waging a war, of winning the war, of winning a war that would be Israel's second war of independence. But right now, there's a lot of anger being directed at this man, and there'll be a lot of reckoning uh, at his fate and his legacy once this war is completed. Well said, uh, Carl Bostic. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon, and thanks for your analysis.